Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Phil from the Door of Hope Church here in Maryborough, Queensland, Australia. We pray and hope that these videos and messages are of encouragement to you in your walk with the Lord. Uh, hello to all our people from different regions in the country and the world. Blessings to you from here in Queensland. If you're benefiting from these videos, we'd encourage you to subscribe and also if you'd like notification when we upload new videos, we encourage you to ring the bell. If you'd like to make a donation to the ministry, there's a link in the comment section below. We pray and hope from the whole team here at the Door of Hope that you be blessed by these videos. Lord, we thank you for the word. We thank you for your word to us. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us by your Holy Spirit to illuminate the truth to us. Lord, we come willingly submitted to your word to teach us, to correct us, to show us. Lord, we, we humble ourselves before you. Lord, open our minds so that we can understand. Clear our ears so that we can hear. Open our eyes so that we can see and understand. Be with us at this time, Lord, in your wonderful name. Amen. So we're continuing in the book of Galatians. And a couple of key verses that I'll read at the start of every sermon on Galatians is Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 to 10. They're the sort of key verses for trying to memorise so that if you're down the track thinking to yourself, Where, what's a good book about the gospel? Or what is the book of Galatians about? If you memorise these verses, this basically gives it in a nutshell, which is Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 to 10. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ." How important is this verse and this understanding coming towards the end? Knowing that the Antichrist will perform, or the second beast of Revelation 13, will perform signs and wonders to seduce or deceive, if possible, even the elect. So therefore, we've got to have some way of working out how can we not be deceived? And I think Paul gives it here because he says, if anyone, even an angel from heaven, so even if an angel appeared here today, and started teaching us something other than the gospel that was preached at the beginning by the apostles, then let that angel be damned, let that angel be cursed. So what this means straight away for anyone who's ever entertained the idea of Islam, Islam came several centuries later and he claimed to have received revelation from an angel. It says, if they preach any other gospel. This, so this is how we protect ourselves from deception. What is the gospel and what is that that you are saying? Is that the gospel? And if it's not the gospel, let them be damned, let them be cursed, don't associate with it, don't try and get entangled with it, just cut it off. It's not the gospel. And verse 10, do I persuade men or God? Now, obviously, if we have the true gospel, we're trying to persuade men to believe the gospel. If we have the false gospel, then we're trying to persuade God to adopt our gospel. And that's what he means there. So last week, what we covered last week, Paul was further authenticating the gospel that he was preaching by showing that it did not come by natural means, but came by the way of revelation. He'd been preaching for about 14 years. In the, he spent three years in the wilderness receiving that revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ directly. He then spent about 14 years traveling, preaching the gospel. So when he's made his way back down to Jerusalem to speak to Peter, James and John, it's about 17 years later. So the gospel revealed to him was also confirmed then to be true and correct by Peter, James and John. The point about that is that he was willing to submit his teaching of the gospel to other teachers, other people. And so that's always a sign to be wary of when someone says, I'm above that sort of assessment. You know, do what I say. This is, I'm the pastor, I'm the apostle, I'm the preacher, I'm the anointed one. And they try and elevate themselves. Now, even Paul himself came, presented his understanding of the gospel to Peter, James and John for them to affirm that he was on track. That's even Paul. And Paul is saying, if anyone preaches any other gospel than that which we preached at the beginning, let them be accursed. So we've got to understand what this gospel is. We have to be willing to allow ourselves to be corrected, 
by sound teaching if we stray from that true gospel in any way. Today, false teachers end up bringing people into bondage because they end up in bondage to sin. In the book of Galatians, we understand that it was a sin to be circumcised. And as I said, it's don't worry, guys, if you're circumcised, it doesn't mean you've sinned. It was a sin to be circumcised here because they were saying you had to be circumcised in order to be saved. They were adding to the gospel a work called circumcision. So therefore, because they were preaching that, but when I gave that story of that illustration, you're either a slave to Jesus Christ or you're a slave to sin. So when people deconstruct their faith and they abandon Christianity, they often have an initial sense of freedom, like an, a, a euphoric, I'm now free to be whoever I want. I'm now free to do whatever I want because Christianity constrains us. Because true Christianity teaches that all have sinned, you have an old man, that fallen nature, that need, you need to submit that nature, you know, deny yourself, take up your cross, submit that nature to the Lord, to be able to walk in the ways of righteousness by the power of the Holy Spirit, and not the flesh according to your soulish carnal nature. So historical Christianity is very constraining, and when people reject it, they feel a sense of freedom. This is very similar to the narrow path, which is hard to find, difficult to walk on, few find it, but then it says the wide path is broad and easy and wide. So they feel that initial sort of euphoric freedom from Christianity, but it's a trap because it leads to bondage. He who commits sin becomes a slave to that sin. So even though we might feel constrained by historic, biblical, true, the true gospel Christianity, that constraint is for our own good. But some people might have thought in their mind, isn't there a verse that says, he whom the Son sets free is free indeed? Isn't Christianity supposed to be about, yay, I'm free? That's a human concept of freedom. That's not the freedom it talks about. So let's clear that up now, just in case anyone misconstrued that. John chapter 8, verse 31 to 36. John 8, 31 to 36. John chapter 8, verse 31 to 36 John 8 31 then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him if and I've highlighted underlined circled if if you abide in my word you are my disciples indeed so therefore if you've just put your hand up somewhere and said Jesus come into my heart come into my life and you're not abiding in the word in other words you're not obeying the word you're not living for Christ you're living for yourself and just somewhere down the track, you put your hand up and said, Jesus, come into my heart. You are not a disciple. Because it says, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Hallelujah. People stop there. Hallelujah. I can come to Jesus and I'm free. Let's keep reading. <laughs> they answered him. We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? In other words, their religious stubborn pride to, to reject that whole idea that they were in bondage of any sort. Because if, if the son is going to make us free, free from what? What bondage are we in? And so the self-deceived religious people said, we're not in bondage, we're descendants of Abraham. So we can be a self-deceived Christian because Christian, I come to church, I do this, I do that. You know, I'm not in bondage. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And this is why we're called to repentance. We're called to come out of that behavior, out of that sin. And, there, and initially that's a struggle. And of course, even as you go along, your old man, your flesh continues to be a struggle because he's still alive and you've got to sort of keep him in check. You know, don't feed him too much. So like if you're trying to give up the addiction to pornography, don't look at pornography online, that's not going to help you. Uh, if you're addicted to shopping, don't go down to the shopping centre, that's not going to help you. Don't, don't look at magazines, like if you're addicted to romance novels, don't go reading Mills and Boons, don't do the things that are going to feed your old man. You've got to put that to death and live a life that is separated unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. So those people who have deconstructed their faith, abandoned Christianity, feel that euphoric freedom to come into, now I can tell you that actually I'm gay. Now that, I can t now that I'm free, I can say that even though I look like a man, I feel like a woman and I'm going to start coming to church dressed as a woman. Um, I'm now free to say, well, 
God's made me an alcoholic, so I just drink on the weekend and come to church, the Lord will have grace on me. You know, like all the sort of distorted views of Christianity, all the distorted views of religion, because they don't understand this. Whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. So therefore, what are we being set free from? We're being set free from the slavery to sin. The Lord Jesus Christ came to save us and and that's the problem too if people are just getting fire insurance because you know I preach about hell and people go well I don't want to go to hell what do I have to do get baptized you know they're getting their fire insurance so that they end up in heaven but that's not it either because when you lay down your life and you give your life to Jesus you're no longer walking it's no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me I'm no longer walking in the flesh and whenever I do walk in the flesh that's my flesh rebelling against God. So I need to repent. I need to get back on track and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, free from what? Free from the slavery of sin, you shall be free indeed. So even though they might feel a euphoric sense of abandoning Christianity, it's only temporary and it leads to serious bondage to sin. The need to resist false teaching I also talked about last week, consciously, deliberately resisting false teaching. We live in a very strange world where people seem to give up that idea of what is sound teaching in order to just be ecumenical. Let's just hold hands as Christians, even between Protestantism and Catholicism. I've seen them come back together, ministers and that who are basically sitting with the Pope saying what a great guy he is. And I'm thinking, we do understand that the Pope is preaching a false gospel. And it says, anyone who preaches any other gospel than that which we preach, even the Pope, let him be damned, let him be cursed. It doesn't matter who you are. You can be the queen. You can be the, you can be the Antichrist who rules the world. If you preach a different gospel, let you be damned, let you be cursed. It's a false teaching. So we need to resist that false teaching, especially as we come towards the end. Now, the only way to do that, of course, is to have clear understanding of what the true gospel is this is where i gave you the story of those who were trained to identify counterfeit notes they didn't spend a couple of weeks trying to figure out what a counterfeit note was they spent a couple of weeks finding out what an actual note is so they studied a true note say hundred dollar bill they studied it thoroughly so they knew everything about it so as soon as they got any sort of counterfeit it's missing this it's missing that it's missing this it doesn't have this so we study the gospel extensively as the first principle upon which to build our Christian faith, to be able to identify false teaching. In order to do that, we need to know what the true gospel is. Now, the false gospel of today, which is fairly common, is not coming from outside the church. There's no pagan outside the church preaching a gospel to lead us astray. There's a false gospel being taught in churches to lead us astray. And this has always been the way, so don't get your back up and say, oh, he's preaching about other churches. Paul had to correct uh, false teaching in the church. Peter corrected false teaching. James, you go back and have a look and a close look. They were always having to deal with false teaching that kept rising in the church to say, no, that's not right. This is what's right. So therefore, the false teaching that's coming into the church today is I think the most insidious is what's called progressive Christianity. And I've often wondered how on earth has this happened? But as I've looked, I've thought there's two causes to it. The first one is, Pentecostal, charismatic or independent churches, which that's probably primarily my background. In those circles, very few of those churches require extensive theological training for the minister. I went to Bible college with about 30 or 40 students and half of them were only doing a 12-month course, which is really just how to be a pastor, how to pastor a church. And then they would launch off and pastor a church. And the, the danger here is that there's that sense of Well, the Holy Spirit's called you. You know, the Holy Spirit will teach you. The Holy Spirit will guide you. And they don't have sound doctrine. And I've seen many of them just err into all sorts of weird philosophies, weird doctrines, weird practices in church because they're not theologically trained. The other side of that is that mainstream Protestant evangelical churches, which we would probably be considered that, although you've got a strange Pentecostal pastor, sorry. Mainstream Protestant evangelical churches, which we would be considered, apart from the pastor, uh, churches require their preachers to have theological training. But the vast majority of that theological training is done in Bible colleges that are progressive or liberal. And so, so the place where we're getting sound biblical teaching in the broader context of the church has really narrowed down. And that's why 
when we first moved to down towards Birkengary, moved up here to Queensland, I think we visited 30 churches and could not find one that preached the actual Bible. And imagine me sitting in a church. <laughs> It'd have to be pretty good, wouldn't it? But they, at least we found one where they used the Bible. The others, they'd preach a verse and then they'd go on to convoluting some other thing and they just jump out of that one verse. So if you ever hear a preacher give you one verse and then talk for half an hour with one verse... I would say, what are you talking about, Bucko? Like, the Bible interprets the Bible. We don't come up with philosophy. We don't come up with our, our sort of understanding of things. We submit to the Word of God. We don't elevate ourselves above it. So looking to people of reputation, this is still last week, looking to people of reputation for support of the gospel is a worldly way of thinking. This is where you know some of those mega churches who have brought in... Uh, celebrities born in famous people to sort of add validity to the gospel uh, let's get some famous people in for recognition prestige but because of the idolization of fame within young people many churches turn this type of behavior as a validation for the message preached the danger is that young people will attach themselves to christianity because they admire or idolize the famous person not because they have come to to be truly born again now, the idea of setting someone up as a famous person, that's okay if, you're, if it's an evangelistic meeting, you're trying to get people in and someone preaches the gospel. But, then, but you don't want to validate the gospel message by a famous person because young people idolise the famous person, they join the organisation, they attach themselves to Christ because that's what their famous person did. They haven't become born again, they haven't seen that they're a wretched sinner who needs salvation. They haven't seen that Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for their sin. I've listened to these sermons and I listen to enough until I can't take it anymore. And they never say Jesus' blood was shed on the cross to pay the price for your sin. They say everything else. Why? Because they want to make themselves attractive to a pagan fallen world. So that is a false gospel. Jesus alone saves by the power of the Holy Spirit, through the sound preaching of the word. Do we believe that? Jesus saves alone by the power of the Holy Spirit through the sound preaching of the word, not through gimmicks, not through other things. And I've seen this over the years. And in God, by the Holy Spirit, can use the most bizarre, peculiar things that you and I wouldn't even do and saves people with it. You know, because he opens the eyes, he clears the ears, he reveals himself to a person's heart they see their eyes are open they become born again and what do they see they see what i was preaching before that i'm a wretched sinner i'm separated from god jesus died on the cross for my sin my only way forward is to put my faith and trust in jesus jesus loved me enough to come and die for me jesus loves me enough to give me a hope and a future lord i give you my life and they're born again by the power of the holy spirit born again through the sound preaching of the word so we don't need gimmicks we just need to know what the gospel is and share the gospel with people. So picking it up from where we left off, Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 to 16. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 to 16. I'll read it first and then we'll go back through it. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 to 16. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with his hypocrisy, with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel... I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as a Jew, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So let's work our way through this a little bit. First of all, in verse 11. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face. 
You know, we live in a culture where it's very politically incorrect to sort of stand up to somebody and like rebuke them to their face or correct them to their face. We live in a sort of world where that's, that's really bad, don't judge. What are the rules? The ultimate sin is judgment. Don't judge me. The ultimate guide is my feelings. The ultimate goal is happiness and the ultimate guess is God. That's the sort of rules that a secular world is operating on at the moment. So if we withstand somebody to their face, they just sort of get their back up. But we've, I think the church has sort of brought that philosophy into the church and said, it's wrong of you to confront me about something that's wrong. It's wrong of you to say something to somebody else. I think what that is, is wrong. Paul withstood Peter to his face in front of everybody. Why? Because this is critical. This is a core doctrine. This is, this is not a periphery drive. They weren't arguing about some peripheral sort of idea like whether Adam actually ate an apple or it was a pear, you know, like, you know, you, we get into these weird debates and arguments. No, this is core. This is central because what he has said is that if anyone, that includes Peter, if anyone preaches any other gospel than that which we preach to you from the beginning, let them be damned, let them be cursed. So he stood in front of Peter and called out his hypocrisy. That is a different gospel, Peter. Stop it. Wow. See, we have these sort of idolised sort of view that the church didn't have its rough patches. <laughs> Imagine the two leaders, Paul and Peter, going head to head because Peter was starting to behave like a hypocrite with a false gospel. But that also warns us, this is how insidious it can be, that Peter was seduced by this. And we may not be seduced by his problem, but we get seduced by things because of our fallen nature. He withstood him to his face. In verse 12, for before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. So before they came, he would eat with Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew himself, separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. So he was playing the hypocrite. Now, Peter has a problem in this area because he's fearing the circumcision. Remember, this is a, the Judaizers, the ones who are saying that you need to be circumcised in order to be saved. That's why it's such a problem, because he's separating himself from the Gentiles, sitting with the Judaizers. Not just the circumcision. See, we look at it and think, well, they're just circumcised. What's wrong with that? Now, they are teaching that you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. He's withdrawn from the Gentiles, sitting with the Judaizers, which is affirming their gospel. So when you sit with somebody who is preaching a false gospel, you are inadvertently affirming the gospel. You need to call it out. That is wrong. He called Peter out. That is wrong, you hypocrite. You are adding circumcision. You are joining the Judaizers. You are playing the hypocrite. There is only one gospel. That is the gospel the Lord Jesus Christ taught us. Peter, what are you doing? Now, Peter obviously had a problem because he wanted to please the Judaizers, the circumcised. Luke chapter 22, verse 34 says, But he said to them, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Remember this from Peter? And he said, Far be it, Lord. You know, I'm ready to die with you, Jesus. And then Jesus said to him, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will die, deny me three times that you even know me. And we know the rest of that story. And the reason he denied him, because when he got into any particular point, he was afraid of the people and what they were thinking of him. He was afraid of even a servant girl beside the fire and what she might say. She was afraid of the Jews and what they might say. He denied Christ out of fear of people. Matthew chapter 10, verse 27, it says, Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach in the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10, 27 and 28. So Peter has a problem because he's not following the Lord's teaching. He's not following what's supposed to be, which is Peter should have stood up to the Judaizers and said, no, stop, that's false gospel, that's false teaching. But he feared them or he wanted to be liked by them or he thought if he sort of sided with them and that he might be able to influence them from the inside, playing the hypocrite. No. So don't fear people. Fear the Lord. Because, you know, even if your body gets killed, that's okay, because you'll be with the Lord forever. But what you should fear is fear him who not only can kill the body, but can kill the soul, casting it into hell. 
So therefore, we're supposed to fear the Lord, and that fear is real and genuine. Today, today people want to soften that. Oh, you mean fear God? Now, if God appeared and you could see hell and, and, and you realise, hold on, am I actually saved? God is about to cast me into hell because I'm a sinner. I can tell you, if you are not saved, you are going to be terrified. That is, that is worse than anything that could possibly ever happen on earth. You're going to see the glory of God. You're going to see his holy, his, his magnificence beyond comprehension. We can't even explain it in human words. And you can see hell out of the corner of your eye. And you can hear the weeping and gnashing of teeth and the anger against God for what's happened to them. And you're standing there. You're going to be terrified. This is terror. And that's what this verse is saying. Don't worry about people. What can they do to you? And we have so many third world issues amongst us when it comes to the preaching of the gospel. Or they may not talk to me again. Or they may not like me. Or they may disagree with me. Or I might get into an argument. Who cares? Right? You're fearing them. You need to learn the skill of being able to talk with people in a way that helps them come to the Lord. Don't, don't be so bombastic and arrogant. And You know, there's some people who do it in such a way, you, I, I see it and I just feel like, saying, oh, stop stop you know they're being rude they're being arrogant they're talking over the top of people you know just really bad now stop that that's not what I'm talking about there's a skill to it there's a way to share the gospel but we're never to be silent out of fear of what people might think I've even seen some Christians down the park when we're preaching down the park they come and see us and they move to the other side of the road and they almost put their head up it's like they're ashamed oh those people are calling out the name of the Lord out in the open like they're they're so religious, they can't cope with that idea. When you're dead to yourself, deny yourself, take up your cross, you live for Jesus alone, you declare his name. Amen? So, but when I, back to our text in verse 14. So we're in Galatians chapter 2, verse 14. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew, live in a manner like Gentiles and not as a Jew, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? But the point I want to pick up is they were not straightforward. We need to be straightforward, clear. Don't add weird things to the gospel. Don't change it to be acceptable to people. Don't just give them the part that you think they'll like. We need to be straightforward, remembering that it is the Lord who saves so if you sit there and think, well, I'm going to tell them this, but I'm not going to tell them that because they may not cope with that, then you're making decisions about how you're going to save them. Be led by the Spirit as to what you say and what you don't say because it's quite often I've sat with people and the Holy Spirit's just shouted me in the back of my head, say nothing, keep quiet and get to know them, which is really hard for me. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's other times where, where they're resistant to the gospel and I sense the Holy Spirit saying, go to town, this person needs to hear this. And I've done that, which you would think is rude, arrogant, over the top. But a couple of years later, I saw that guy in church playing drums. And he said, yeah, that night, after, and I talked to him, he said, that night after you did that, I could not sleep. And he went back to church, he heard the gospel, he got on track and he was saved. Now, that doesn't mean you do that every time. You've got to learn how to be led by the Holy Spirit in what you're doing. So, but we need to be straightforward. Don't try and hide things. Don't try and sugarcoat things. Don't try and make the gospel more palatable than what it is. You know, when Jesus was teaching the apostles, they even came to him and said, will anybody be saved? That means the apostles heard Jesus teaching and, and it was so strict, so exclusive, so divisive that they said, is anyone going to be saved? And that's when he told them the story about the narrow path and the wide path. Narrow hard and difficult to find, hard to walk on, narrow, few find it. So Jesus himself even said there's going to be few Christians, not a lot, a few. The wide path is much more tempting, much easier. And so the things that we've been looking at is that wide path, the sort of philosophy. Now, this is not the complete uh, philosophy of what people think, but it's certainly something to consider. Might have turned itself off, I'll just reset it. Okay, we're not moving for some reason. Ah, oh, there you go. Yep. Did you do that or me? Okay. So you remember these things. Now, these are just a guide. This is just looking at the world that we preach the gospel into. Very different world. 
I was just saying to Graham when we were preaching down the park yesterday, I said, if we did this back in the 70s or 80s, there'd be a crowd here. We do it now and people walk past and it's almost like, oh, those people are talking. Can you text me instead? <laughs> it's like people just don't know how to talk anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we've got to think about the people, the world we're in, because not only in terms of sharing the gospel, who those people are, but this tendency to be brought into the church or if you, when you become saved, that you sort of marry up this worldly philosophy with Christianity and you end up with some sort of hybrid faith, which is very dangerous because you could end up with a false gospel. You can end up with false teaching in different things and still be saved. But if you end up with a different Jesus or a different gospel, you are not saved. You are saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone. He said, I'm the way, the truth and life. No one, no one will come to the Father except through me. So therefore, if you alter that gospel and make it some other gospel, you're not saved. That's the core of our Christianity. Christianity hinges on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If he did not die and if he did not rise again, we have nothing. We are fools. Everything stems off the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So therefore, don't let this stuff creep in. Feelings are the ultimate guide. Happiness is the ultimate goal. Judging is the ultimate sin. And God is the ultimate guess. Now, if you try and share the gospel into that environment, down comes the wall, glaze goes the eyes. Because the very first part of the gospel is that God created the heavens and the earth and man sinned. Okay, well, hold on. God's the ultimate guess. How do you know he created the heavens and the earth? And besides sin, yeah, my feelings don't tell me I'm a sinner. My feelings tell me I'm a good person. And besides telling me I'm a sinner makes me feel unhappy. I don't like that. And you're judging me. All right, so it just gets shut down. Have you ever been in that conversation where you tried to share the gospel and you just sort of get shut down? That's because they're seeing the world differently than you. They don't, you're coming at it from your understanding, your perspective, and when they hear it, they go, what are you taught? No, just stop. Don't tell me I'm a sinner. Don't tell me God's judging. How can God, if judging is the ultimate sin, that means you're saying God's a sinner. He's judging people. No, 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 no. God doesn't judge people. And that hence, you're starting to see where we're going. God loves you unconditionally. God is a God of love. A God of love could never create hell. A God of love could never let sin. He'll just forgive you for what you've done because he loves you and he'll receive you in because he's a God of love. And they distort the whole thing based on these sort of ideas. So we're going to work our way through them because I know that you know here, because you wouldn't still be here by now if you didn't know this, that man is not just, verse 16, man is not justified by the works of the law but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by works of the law no flesh shall be justified. But let's work our way through these. Feelings are the ultimate uh, guide. So the first thing, remember the first thing we have to do is understand within ourselves what's wrong with that. Because how can you help somebody come to a realisation that that idea is just wrong? Now, now, hear me when I say that. You might sense and know within yourself that it's wrong, but you can't go up to somebody and say, oh, by the way, what you believe is wrong. You need to believe like me. Right? Because feelings are the ultimate guide. So feelings are the ultimate guide means that it turns into like tit for tat. What you believe is what you believe, relativism. Your truth is true for you. My truth is true for me. How can you tell me that I'm wrong? You see, Satan has inoculated people against the gospel. You need skill to be able to do this. Feelings are the ultimate guide. Now, what we believe is that the scriptures are truth revealed. Now, this is fundamentally different. And I don't, I don't think a lot of Christians realise how important this difference is. Because we say that the Bible reveals truth. God has revealed himself. Not, I've searched for God and came up with some sort of theological understanding. That's religion not that i've looked at the world and the universe and made up some sort of human philosophy that's they're all man-made they're all philosophies religions we fundamentally believe that god has revealed himself and even if people can't initially when you're evangelizing say uh, I, I can't believe that that bible's you know the inerrant authoritative word of god there's contradictions in it the jesus in matthew is different than the jesus in john 
You know, did he take two donkeys down to Jerusalem or one? One says one, one says two. You know, one says he, he died by being hung. The other one says he died by his belly being burst open. It's full of contradictions. Okay, so that's okay. Well, you can work with that because you don't need to believe that that is the inerrant inspired word of God in order to be saved. Jesus never said, believe the scriptures and you'll be saved. He said, believe in me and you'll be saved. Now, we'll deal with that over time because even many of you here have gone, I can't believe I actually believe those things. <laughs> and then when you've heard sound teaching and you've corrected your thinking, that correction goes on and on. I'm always correcting my false ideas as time goes on. I'm not saved by having my doctrine about eschatology right. I'm saved by being born again into Jesus Christ. So therefore, I need a revelation of what's going on. The gospel, this is why he's saying the gospel, the first things, the gospel, what is it? So therefore, scripture is revealed. Now, if people struggle with the scripture, then start with Jesus. Because Jesus is the one who's going to save them. Jesus is an historical fact. That's undisputable. They can go to even secular history, psychology. You know, they can go anywhere they like to find that out. Jesus is historical fact. You can't refute that. Because if you do then we don't know anything. You get into that ridiculous philosophy that says, how do you know you're even real? Okay, I'm not talking about garbage like that. I'm talking about actual concrete, what is historical? Jesus Christ is an historical fact. The question isn't, is he real or not? The question is, was he who he claimed to be? Jesus claimed to be God incarnate. He clearly said, I've come to die for the sins of the world, to save sinners. So, so step one, yes, Jesus is real. Step two, is he who he claimed to be? That's the big question. Because if somebody answers that question and says, well, I think he is, everything else changes. Because they go, if he is who he claimed to be, that means he is God in the flesh, the Christ, the Messiah. That means, and he himself quite often quoted scriptures and fulfilled scriptures. So all these other things like, does God exist? Is scripture the word of God? Start to fall into line because they've come to realise that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, God incarnate. So therefore start with Jesus. The reason we can so confidently do that is that nowhere else in human history has this happened. That archaeology and scriptural textual criticism, you can go back and have a look through all of human history, nowhere else in human history has this happened where thousands and thousands of manuscript arise in history from one event. No one. The closest is 800 manuscripts from a work of poetry where people copied it. So we are talking about the Lord Jesus Christ where we don't have phones, we don't have the internet, all we have is writing and you, you would write, if you saw a miracle, you would write to your family, you'd write to your cousin, you'd write to your uncle. They would pass that on. They would copy that and pass that on. The letter from the apostles would go to one church, they'd copy it, and then they'd pass it on to the next. And so we have, uh, uh, at a minimum, 5,000, but I think the figure is more accurately, 25,000 pieces of manuscript appeared in history about the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing like that has ever happened anywhere. So apart from what you think, that proves that something happened, something significant happened. Not just, a, not just a good story, not someone didn't sit down and write a story about Jesus, something actually happened in history. So then we go to all this writing and because we've got so much, we can compile a reliable account. So I'm still going to concede to some people at this point, okay, let's just accept it's got some errors in it. But those errors don't devalue the reality that something happened in history and that we can see within that story that Jesus lived, said what he did, did what he did, died on the cross and rose again. You know, we may argue about whether there was one or two donkeys or whether he, he died by bursting out or was hung. You know, we can sort that out and there are ways to sort that out. But I wouldn't go there as an argument because you don't need that to be saved. You need to believe that Jesus Christ was God incarnate, died on the cross to pay the price for your sins. We start with Jesus. So therefore, scripture is the ultimate sort of guide for us, the truth revealed. So if we go though with the idea that feelings are the ultimate guide, then how can I say to you that the Bible is true and the Quran is false? If, I, if I'm talking to a person who says feelings are the ultimate guide, 
So they don't believe in revealed truth, they believe in the discovery of truth. Then how can I say between the Quran, yep, pick all of my tracks up later, how can I say between the Quran and the Bible which one's true? See, because if I base my ideas on my feelings of the guide, then if I say to somebody the Quran is a lie, it's false, they will just say, well, that's your truth, that's your opinion. So we have to clearly understand I'm not claiming that Christianity is true because of my feelings. I'm not claiming that Christianity is true because I have some good philosophical argument. Because otherwise, and I've heard people say this, Christians say this when they go, I believe the Bible is true because it resonates in my heart. Well, I can tell you a, a Muslim terrorist who is about to kill himself believes the Quran resonates in his heart. That's nothing. That's no argument. That's a lot ridiculous. So your feelings about the Bible are irrelevant because Muslims believe this, feel the same thing about the Quran. So you can't come to this with, I believe the Bible is the word of God because you'll just be shut down. Feelings are the ultimate guide. How can you say I'm wrong? And when, when you do it that way, what happens is they then think that you're arrogant, judgmental. How dare you? Just, you're just elevating your opinion above mine. What's so wonderful about you that you can say to me, the Bible is the truth and the Quran is wrong? You're just elevating yourself. You're, you're just arrogant. You're just proud. That's just ridiculous. Tell me why. So you have to be able to go, why do I believe that the Bible is the word of God? And you need to be, have far more than I feel it is, or I believe it is, or I think it is. What have I given you today to give you confidence? that nowhere else in human history has such an event happened that over 25,000 pieces of manuscript had appeared in human history. I can tell you that did not happen with this. I can tell you that when those testimonies of Jesus Christ were written, and we know this in Corinth, that over 500 people, many of which were still alive when it was written. So imagine if I came to you and I said, I've seen the Christ, the Messiah, I saw him raise a young girl from the dead. Because remember, he did many more miracles than what are recorded in scripture. If that happened, I'd be coming to you and say, oh, he, he was died, crucified, he appeared to us. I'd be going to find those people. I'd be going, did you see him risen from, the, did you see him risen from, did you see, and, and, and you can start to tell these people have actually seen something. These people have actually seen Jesus risen from the dead, over 500 at the same time, many of which were still alive when Corinthians was written. So therefore, if it wasn't true, it's going to go nowhere. So therefore, it has spread like fire, not because it's a good story, it has spread like fire through the Middle East because it is true. So therefore, it's not about my opinion against your opinion. We have historical fact, we have textual criticism. Now, I had a friend once that I tried to witness to and I oh, actually, I just gave up in the end because remember, there's those people who are, are ignorant because of unbelief. They just, I'm not going to believe. And, and we saw that with the Jews. When Jesus raised people from the dead, did miracles, they said, you're not the Christ, you're a liar. They had the Christ right in front of him. There are some people that are just never going to believe. He tried to argue with me that there's no difference between the Easter bunny and Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, you might laugh, but you've got to be careful not to laugh when people say things like that because he's serious. In his mind, it's just a fairy tale. Now, so I turned around and said, oh, the Easter Bunny? So tell me, where was the Easter Bunny born? Oh, it's just made up, myth and legend. Oh, well, I can tell you where Jesus was born. Where, was the Easter, where does the Easter Bunny live? Where did he live? Oh, that's a myth and a legend. I don't know where, oh, I can tell you where Jesus lived. And all of a sudden you realise, no, the Easter Bunny is nothing like Jesus. And this is con what's called contextual criticism. They can look into the text and they can know that it's right because it's containing historically accurate information about towns, places. And when they've done it, they've also found that the writer had to have intimate local knowledge. Now, if I, if I said to you, I'll meet you at the top of town, you may not know where that is. But anyone who lived in Geelong back in the 80s knew exactly where that was. So they know that in the text there are ways of describing things which clearly indicate that the people lived in that place at that time and had local knowledge that they couldn't have written it 200 years later because they didn't know that. You don't know the top of town because you didn't live in Geelong 
Everybody who lived in Geelong knew where the top of town was. So you'd have to go, if, if this was in the Bible, you'd have to go back to Geelong, find some historical, where's the top of town? Where's the top of town? Oh, there it is. Everybody locally knew that. So that's why you have things written in here, which you go, what's that? Where's that? Because they're writing to a church that's existing at that time. They'll write about things that are accurate, uh, geographically accurate, historically accurate, uh, even down to like the Caesars and the government and the structures and the people and the places. And so it has been, people have tried to pull it apart. They have studied it and they have tried to get it. But every person who does that goes, hmm, there's something different about this. I can't seem to pull it apart. Why? Because the people who have written about Jesus Christ are actually writing about real history. So it's not like the Quran. The Quran is a guy who camped in a desert somewhere and thought he had a vision. He only performed one miracle, supposedly, and that miracle no one witnessed. So Jesus Christ performed miracle after miracle after miracle. Thousands of eyewitnesses who saw what he did, heard what he said. The Bible, we say that scriptures are truth revealed, not because I believe it, not because I feel it or anything like that, because it's actually true and I can prove that it's actually true. So therefore, when you get into this idea that feelings are the ultimate God, no, your feelings can lead you anywhere. John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. We've already done this um, this morning, but just to get out of it at that point. John chapter 8, verse 31 to 32. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and, what, and you shall know the truth. Jesus Christ, who is a real historical figure, easily provable that he was, this is clearly, reliably his teaching, Jesus believed that there is such a thing as truth. So therefore, Jesus didn't believe in relativism. Jesus didn't believe in the idea that there's truth for you and there's truth for me. So see what I'm doing. If I was talking to a non-Christian, what I'm trying to do is get them to, first of all, accept that Jesus Christ is a real historical figure, accept that the Bible is an accurate, reliable historical account of that life, and that therefore we need to hear what he has to say. And Jesus has said, there is truth. So truth is not relative. Jesus said, there is truth. Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, and if you abide in my word, and where do we get that truth? My word. You are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and that truth shall set you free. So therefore there is truth revealed in Jesus Christ. That's why we say scripture is the revelation of truth. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It's inspired by God. Now, progressive Christians change the meaning of this word. You've got to be careful of this. They, they're cunning. Because what they do is they say, yes, it was inspired. So if you ask a progressive Christian, do you believe the Bible is the inspired word of God? They will say, yes. But then as time goes on, you think, I'm not sure that you do. And then you go, what do you mean by inspired? And what they mean is like when my wife paints a picture, she gets inspiration for painting a picture. When an author of a book writes a book, he gets inspiration for writing the book. When a, an artist writes a song, he gets inspiration to write a song. So therefore they see the Bible as no different than that sort of inspiration. That's not uh, theological inspiration. Theological inspiration is not the unction that you had to do some creative work. Inspiration from a Christian perspective is that God by the Holy Spirit was uh, ensuring that what you wrote was exactly what he wanted written. It was not this creative inspiration. It's divine inspiration by the Holy Spirit. Very clear difference. So you've got to be careful with these people. They change the meaning of words. Uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? Doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. So therefore we believe that the scripture is the truth revealed. And we believe that that truth is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why John said, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus came into the world as the ultimate word, the logos, the revelation of truth into the world personified. But we have that reliably here in scripture, inspired. So now, if you, you I know that you know, because you wouldn't still be here if you didn't believe that the Bible is the word of God. 
The Bible is inspired. The Bible is authoritative. So you go to the Bible for evidence of truth. You go to the Bible for who is God? What is sin? How do we get saved? You go to the Bible to find that out. You don't create something in your mind. But the problem is the people we are trying to witness to don't think like that. So you have to approach that witnessing from a different perspective because they believe in feelings are the ultimate guide, that your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. And that doesn't mean we're going to be able to save everybody once we understand that. There'll some people who are going to be locked into that and you'll never get around it. But the discussion doesn't... If you jump to Jesus died for your sins, that's nice. That's your truth. That's not my truth. You're not going to get anywhere. You have to discuss truth and what is truth and where does truth come from? Does truth exist? Is truth relative? So you've got to ask people questions. You've got to have a discussion with people. You've got to sort of try and understand where people are coming from because you're going to do some gardening. This is a better way to think of evangelism. We always want to rush to picking the fruit, remember? We always want to go to the sinner's prayer, get a Christian, get someone saved, pick the fruit, like, you know, the fruit. I can tell you I've been working hard in the garden, if you noticed, and I haven't picked any fruit yet. <laughs> you dig, you pull weeds, you set up garden beds, you water, you fertilise, you prune, you working, 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 working. And maybe in a few months, I might pick some fruit. So you've got to discern that the far, the vast majority, sorry, of your work with other people is not fruit picking. It is actually gardening. So you may need to garden with them in the understanding of truth. Ask them, do you believe in relative truth or absolute truth? And if they say, what are you talking about? Well, then go to this. Well, do you believe your feelings are the ultimate God? Like I can have a truth and you can have a truth. Do you believe that or not? Well, yeah, I do. Well, then you go to logical inconsistencies. Well, then you would say then that those who believe this truth, that's good for them. And those who believe this truth, that's good for them. But I have a problem with that because they say that Jesus never died and the Christians in their book say that Jesus did die and Christianity hinges off the fact that Jesus died and rose from the dead. So you throw it back to them. So how can that be true and that be true? That doesn't make sense to me. And then the question is, how does that work? You put it back to them. How does that work? Because see, we're so used to people putting us under pressure that we've forgotten that we actually have the truth. We should be putting other people under pressure. If you believe that truth is relative, then how can you reconcile two clearly, rationally, logically inconsistent statements from two religions? How do you, what do you do with that? And they'll quickly realise that they have not thought through their philosophy. They have not thought through. So then you're going to try and garden. You're going to try and garden them to the idea that there is truth. And that truth needs to be revealed to us. And that truth is revealed to us in the Bible. If you can get somebody to there, that you are off, you're on the journey. Because if somebody starts to believe the Bible is true, all you need to do is say, how about we sit down and read the Bible together? And you just read it without judgment, without preaching, you just go to John, you go to the little tracks you should always carry around with you, go to the little bread of life track and you say, how about we sit down and we read through it together? Because now they're starting to open up to the idea that there is scripture that reveals truth. So you've got to garden before you get there. Happiness is the ultimate goal. I'll pick that up next week because I won't finish under an hour if I start that one. Lord, I thank you for your word. Jesus, I thank you that you have revealed truth to us. And Lord, I pray for everybody here that's trying to witness to their family and their friends and the people around them. Lord, I pray that you will give us this skill to be able to get to those beliefs in the background that are preventing them from believing. I pray also, Lord, that you help us to discern those that are just closed off, that we need to just sort of have a nice day and move on. And those, Lord, that you are calling us to put a lot of work into, long discussions about what the idea of truth is, doing gardening. So, Lord, just even now, just bring to mind, everybody, just bring to mind those people that you hope to see saved, that you hope the Lord will give you an opportunity. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we pray for them. We pray that you will open their eyes, that you will soften their heart. We pray, Lord, for opportunities to have deep, meaningful conversations with them, that they might be saved. In your wonderful name.
Amen. Now, just one more piece of advice in regard to evangelism. What you're always trying to do is get to the real conversation. You know when you talk with people, you know you're getting the... It's like now, if we can, how's the footy, how's the day, how, you know, it's superficial. If you want real evangelism, you've got to get past the superficial to a real conversation. When you know that this person is actually telling me what they believe. If you, if, and that is a real privilege. That is a real... I take that as, wow, this person has actually opened up what they actually believe to me. Now, I need to be gentle. I need to be caring. I need to be thoughtful because they have opened up their life to me. So the skill of helping people to open up their life to you, to have a good discussion about what they believe. Sometimes I think we roughshod people where they keep that to themselves. That's why one-on-one, that's why I say, let's sit down and read the Bible together and we just talk about what they believe. Oh, where'd you get that from? Why do you believe that? How does that work? And I explore their life in light of Scripture. Then they'll turn around and say, well, what do you think? Glad you asked. This is what I think. <laughs> you know, we're on a journey, we say journey with people. That preaching at people, bang, doesn't seem to work anymore because of these philosophies that are in society. Amen?